Hello and welcome to the Open Era Podcast. My name is Devang Desai and I'm joined, as always, by Mr. Simon Bushel. Bush, it's been a while since we've been recording live, I guess, after a big tournament following a, a massive moment in the tennis calendar. It's been a few weeks. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. I'm pleased to hear that you referred to the National Bank Open as a <laughs> massive moment in the tennis calendar. It is just a regular Masters 1000, but sure, we'll go with that. Well, I, I say this because there was some huge news, Bush, that uh, that did drop in Toronto. So forgive me for the hyperbole. But aside from that, which we'll get to, of course, the tennis was actually quite good. And I think for once, because they had the symmetry with the events in Toronto, Montreal, things kind of were synced up properly. So you could watch things kind of streamlined throughout the day. And there was a ton of great matches on all the time. So the biggest moments from the week, obviously, two Outstanding winners, uh, the retirement or the uh, evolving away of Serena Williams, and also your appearance on CTV. So um, <laughs> a massive yeah. week across the board, it has to be said. Huge stuff. Um, yeah, move over, Lloyd Robertson. I'm coming for you. <laughs> uh, but no, it was good to grow the brand, as they say, as I shudder saying brand earnestly. But no, it was fun to do. Some more upcoming, perhaps, hopefully, as we uh, as we take over the tennis world, at least in Canada, in terms of news cable stations. Got to start somewhere, right? Canada seems a good place to start in that regard. <laughs> it's true. Shall we begin with the, the biggest news then, Bush, of, of the week that was? That's right. Um, Serena Williams is evolving away from tennis. She's not retiring, because that's a dirty word, apparently, as illustrated in this Vogue article. But uh, I saw you talking about it on CTV for another plug on that one. And I thought it was interesting <laughs> some of the things that you had to say about it. I'm sort of a little, I've, I've taken a little bit of a step back in, in some capacity just from uh, being in depth the day to day of the tennis world. And I only did that because I was curious to see how, how Serena Williams' retirement announcement sort of was covered by the press in general. And I thought it got a pretty pretty good write-up in general, and, and those thought pieces were out there. But it did lead me to an interesting conversation and, and, and sort of overall discussion point of what is a retirement supposed to look like in 2022 of someone of this caliber and this stature? Because this is not just a person announcing a retirement and then doing it on a date. This is a long farewell tour. And I think that got me thinking about what what did we think a retirement was supposed to be like for any of the big three or Serena or Venus? Because I'd never actually considered that. We all knew it was coming, but what is it actually supposed to look like? And I think we're about to see that in action. It's true. And I, I wonder, I probably would have rather have it been like a single match one-off, maybe without knowing that the end was coming. Because I think while it was amazing to see the outpouring of love and support for Serena in Toronto, it was... A bit melancholy as well, and and just basically like, well, bye, or like, this is it, sad, very sad, and we're going to keep seeing her play, but with each match that comes, her losing takes on more significance, even though the results really don't matter anymore, and I think she's she said that well in that Vogue article about showing up 23 times and also winning a whole other bunch of doubles titles with her sister, like, she's she's done enough, she's done more than enough to cement herself in the upper echelon of the game, but I, I felt like... I look at like each practice session now in Cincinnati where there's thousands of fans flocking to her. I don't know if that's necessarily what she would have wanted. And I, I don't know if it's awkward for her, but I could tell by the end of the Toronto stint when she lost to Ben, she then didn't do press afterwards. You could tell she was a bit sick of the questions probably. Yeah, I think so. Is it just me or has this been just a little bit tame? Like a little bit contained in a lot of ways? Just I know, And I know she had some significant write-ups and some of the outlets that were covering her and the press attention that was towards her. But it's sort of, it's a little bit toothless when it's a little bit, when it's across a larger period of time, um, in the sense that no one really knows what is the moment, what is the time. And I think that will look like, it will be different when it's at the US Open, perhaps. Well, I think that's, this is what's going to happen. In New York, Mm -hmm. it's going to be magnified times a million, and there'll be a lot more things happening uh, on the day-to-day to cover this. It happened in Canada, not to not to dig our, our own country, but I mean, it no, is Canada, <laughs> and we should dig our own country. To be honest, look at our, look at ourselves in the mirror. But it didn't happen in the states. It's going to happen in the states. She's in Cincinnati now. It, it'll build to this crescendo where everyone will be talking about it. I, I did see though 
it broke through definitely when the announcement was made. And I think the cynic in me is like, Anna Wintour is like, haha, like Vogue is back, baby, because everyone is caring about us again. Um, but I saw like the debate shows in ESPN talking about it, which you know it's really see through because it's it's summer perhaps as well. But they made a mockery of that debate as well. I just I think it'll it'll build from here, and it does give us some runway to really I think like catalog Serena's legacy or, or what what evolving away means. And not it sounds almost Pokemon esque, but I feel like there's <laughs> there's another phase coming here beyond. But I, I thought. In that article, what she was talking about in terms of like the comparisons that um, to a, a Tom Brady type or someone like that not having to pause their career to have children or, or some, some of the things she touched on, I thought Bush were interesting. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and we can sort of go bullet point by bullet point because it's interesting. I think just one final point before we get into that, which is that I mentioned off the top, what does a figure like this retiring look like in 2022? Because... I think in our in our life of watching sport, we've seen a, a huge evolution in in the in the figure, the idea of what that sort of relationship looks like in terms of how celebrity is presented and, and held in in so many different capacities. And I, I think that's curious that on one hand you sort of have your your Tim Duncan figure who sort of announces after everything without any fanfare at all and shows up and gets a, a t shirt and leaves, and then you do have your Kobe Bryant esque sort of uh, eight month tour farewell yeah. tour of of going round things and and being serenaded at every single event that he goes to. And I, I think we just, she's such a, a huge figure in, in our sport that what that retirement looks like, I think will be curious over the next few months. And I'm very excited in some ways to see how that works. Um, but I think it's also one of those that I think the U S open is just going to be an absolute cluster. <laughs> and and I think we're going to see yeah. some good and bad during yeah. that whole period of time. Imagine what you think it'll be in times <laughs> nine by 10, I think will be the, the final net. And the fact that she's going to play Emma Rajikanu in, in Cincinnati as well, feels almost made for TV ish to me. Um, Maybe it was. And I, was uh, <laughs> I, whew, I, I'm glad you said it. And I did Simon knowing the strict libel laws and the state of Ohio, but <laughs> I was hoping for Coco Goff, perhaps. I think the tenor of this will change as well as we get closer to New York because she'll have to stop. I think the the weird part of announcing it when she did in Toronto is that she had she had talked the night before and when she had won her first round match about like laying out kind of what's to come for the future of the WTA and, and what's next and and the process of of coming back and it's it's a massive thing to just start again. And I think from Wimbledon forward, we were talking on the Discord, like perhaps she could do this a couple of years down the road where she's just playing this regimented block of seasons. But you can tell, like, it's not, it's not really possible at this point in her career. So like just the day-to-day of her practicing and, and getting through match after match, you're almost just hoping that she'll get there as well. Because I think in a perfect world, there is there is a, an amazing Jimmy Connors-esque moment at the US Open where she makes a deep run. But I also just want to see her get there healthy and just play freely and play tennis the way she wants to play because that's what it's all about. I promise we will get to the article in a second. I just wanted to ask you a question really quickly. Did this surprise you? Or, or I guess, how did this land with you in some capacity? Because for me, she's already been retired. Like th- I think she's been right. retired for a year in right. my head in the same way that Roger Federer is already retired. Like I think... I have come to terms with that in a lot of ways that he retired in that Herbie, Hubie Hercat match at Wimbledon. That was the end for him. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I think whatever happens next, I think nothing will will top famous last words here, what happened there. And I think the same thing is true for Serena Williams. I think her her retirement sort of moment was that loss in the US Open final as well. Like that was the moment for me that sort of cemented that it was sort of over in a lot of ways. Has she been retired in your mind? Or do you think there was a run, one more run coming as well? It's a fair question. I guess I didn't expect the the announcement to hit me as hard as it did, even though we all saw it coming. Mm-hmm. I'll put it that way. Even though we, we were all expecting it. And like you said, like she has kind of been retired for a while now. And I, I probably won't remember her losing. Uh, no, let me rephrase that. I won't really focus in on the match aspects of what happened in Toronto. But I'll, I'll look at this week as kind of maybe uh, some finality to it as well and and. I think it hit for me when I saw Olympia, like her, her, her kid watching her like in the stands. And she was saying as well, like th- that was an it moment for her to be like, holy cow, like here I am. This is the moment. I just was surprised at the way it happened. And I shouldn't have been because it was classic Serena. But I, I think the, the reaction within the wider tennis community was one of 
a little bit of mourning as well, which I thought, mm-hmm. I'm like, well, we're still going to get to see your play. And I think as their article mentions, this is an evolution. And like the way it is still kind of open-ended. I'm like, who knows? Who knows what the future will bring? Well, as, as someone on this podcast who has predicted that Ash Barty will be back from her, uh, I have from to her say, evolution I have to go. <laughs> I have to keep going out on a limb here and say she will be back in 2024. But the, the court stuff, were you surprised she touched on that? I was. Yeah, I was. So, I mean... I have hinted at it numerous times. Let's get, let's get to it block by block. So basically, she opens the article, and it's a lot of stuff about family. It's about her daughter. It's about her family and growing up. It's about her relationship with her sisters, um, with her parents. There's some interesting stuff in there as well about how she very explicitly uh, talks to and highlights King Richard as a piece of almost... Um, not necessarily a biopic and not necessarily like a fable, but like in reality. And I think that's one of the things of having creative control over that as a piece of media is that she can point to it now and say that like, that's the, that's the truth version of what happened with me growing up. But I think the line that caught a lot of people by, uh, not necessarily by surprise, but it, it made headlines was her sort of um, stance in, in saying that if she was a guy, she would not have to choose between uh, a family and her professional career or playing deeper into her 40s in a, in a professional capacity, especially in relation to someone like Tom Brady, who's still going at the age of 41, obviously different sports, less is expected on the on the body physically. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stop burying the NFL, but um, yes, anyway, uh, just, just curious. I think she's right in a lot of ways, right? I think that's one of those things that at least having that voice out there is important. It's, it's kind of a weird one, right? Like, because Yes, she's obviously correct. But at the same time, it's kind of an obvious statement. That's where I kind of found myself on. It was like, yeah, like, unfortunately, that's just the reality of the way that women in, in professions have to, to operate. And that's not, necessarily a, that's not necessarily a good thing at all in the way that we've structured our society. But unfortunately, that's just kind of a shitty reality of it. It's true. But I, I think someone like Serena saying this and putting this out in the consciousness cannot be a bad thing. And, and no. much like I think the the conversation, I think it was around Wimbledon about uh, players going through their menstruation cycle and like how that's affecting them playing and how that's never really mentioned as a reason why a player might be having an off day, even though that's perfectly plausible. I think bringing this to the, the attention of the wider viewing public is massively important. And I, I see what you're saying, but I, I think I liked how for me that it took the tone and it took the tone of defiance in this regard where it's like listen like this is what's on my mind and how i'm gonna throw it out there and it's up to you how you want to digest it and i appreciate it for that yeah so did i and you mentioned it and we've alluded to it she absolutely wants margaret court's record Uh and i think she has made peace with the fact that she's not going to get it perhaps unless something crazy happens um but it's it's kind of cool to see it written in the way that she does like very openly very explicitly like to say um, no, I wanted that record. I, I, de- I definitely do want it. And it's something that I do chase and have chased. Um, but it's extraordinarily unlikely that she's going to get that record. I think it's also interesting in the way that she highlights Monica Sellers as well as someone that she looked up to and, and surpassed in so many ways is because Sellers in, in so many, like that sort of big power game that Serena, you can tell, modeled herself on in so many different capacities. But it's kind of kind of cool to see the way that um, Serena refers to Monica Sellers in terms of lauding her from what she did from a, uh, from a pioneering standpoint and from an inspiration standpoint as well. Super cool. And I, I think mentioning the people that have impacted her throughout her career in tennis terms as well was, was super interesting. I think the quote about showing up 23 times I thought was maybe the most par- powerful aspect of the sporting contingent of the piece and framing it that way um, quote actually it's extraordinary but these days if I have to choose between building my tennis resume and building my family I choose the latter I think that's someone also recognizing the writing on the wall regarding winning that 24th slime Simon so that's Mm-hmm. Some acceptance, perhaps, but I thought that was a powerful moment. And then a lot, not so powerful, but the shout out to JP Morgan. Well, shout out to you. <laughs> shout out to the banks. <laughs> well, I guess I can say something controversial. And I think I've wrestled with my own stance on someone like Serena Williams is that, I mean, intersectionality is a thing. Class is a thing, right? And we can't deny the fact that she is, she ain't messing with no broke anymore, right? She is swimming with billionaires. She's around corporate banks and venture capitalists. There was also a shout out to a mentor in Sheryl Sandberg, who is, you know, a horrendous person with a terrible background <laughs> as well. So uh, we have all that to, to deal with. But I, I will say, I think 
my I sort of summarize my feelings on this. I admire and love Serena Williams, the tennis player. I have extremely limited and less time for Serena Williams, the corporate billionaire, and really don't find her that interesting at all, um, which I think is difficult for a, for a lot of people to square that circle. But I don't really believe in the idea of solving capitalism through capitalism, which I think is ultimately where she's netting out at the moment. Yeah, I think her, her spouse is wearing a Rage Against the Machine hat in, in Toronto. I'm like, I don't, Come think, on, dude. I don't <laughs> think the message is being received here at, well at all. This is something to wrestle with as well, where it's like, how could I'm not hating on someone achieving what Serena's achieved, and it's beyond my scope to, to understand or grasp what she's achieved. But I think from my perspective, my lens, I the less VC money or the less venture capitalist money has a role to play in terms of furthering society, perhaps, or like furthering profits i don't know I, I saw a graphic that was like serena is a billionaire like here are all, all her investments that wasn't the part that uh, made her an icon around the world and an inspiration to many i think that's just another thing that you add to the portfolio much like federer when we talk about whatever the hell he is doing with his his money etc right it's something that i actually kind of want to avoid but i i know it's that's turning a blind eye basically no i agree i agree yeah, there was there's parts of this article where I found myself just kind of drifting out of it a little bit of being like, I don't really give a shit about Serena Ventures or like what the future holds from a money making perspective or from a, you know, empowering women through becoming billionaires kind of perspective. Like it does very, very little for me. Um, admittedly, maybe I'm not the right target audience for it in so many ways. And I readily accept that. That's completely fair. Probably. Um, <laughs> Most likely, yes. Most likely, I can safely say probably. I just think, I just think it's interesting. Like you, you sort of have all this stuff happening with at the same time with uh, very prominent articles being written and summarized around the world about the backlash to the girl boss kind of ideal. I saw the BBC running a big story about this during the course of the week and I couldn't help but have those two things in my mind as reading those articles within the space of two or three days from each other. I, I hear you. And like again, two dudes talking about this, I, I totally yeah. understand. <laughs> yeah. They're like, shut the hell up and what are you talking about, you morons? I get Completely it. I totally fair. understand Completely where you're coming legitimate. from. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think for me and this and to take it again on a personal bent and be and to to make it about me as usual, Simon. I would say I think this is also one of those things where it's like, wow, this has been a long time. Like Serena's played for most of my life. Like I've watched her play professional tennis since I was 10 or around 10 years old to now. And I'm I'm far away from 10. Like it's been a long time. And I, again, I, I refer to some of these great tennis players as security blankets. And that's because they were and they have been around for ages and they've been playing massive matches for a long time and they've created lasting memories that I, I truly cannot forget, even if I wanted to, because they are glued in my mind uh, for better, or for worse, whether it be amazing wins or, or catastrophic losses. And I think this announcement and this kind of procession to the end is another one of those moments where it's like, well, time is undefeated once again, as we get ready to watch Stan and Andy play in Cincinnati. It's like, this is all going to stop eventually and i understand we'll all move on but for this era and and my tennis watching fandom like serena williams was the damn god and it's gonna be weird uh not to to see her on the tour anymore as a tennis player unsurpassed as as a story as a fighter as someone from a from a technical standpoint from all of those things from rewriting record books and being an inspiration to many on the court there will be no one in our lifetime that will surpass that. I, I do genuinely believe it. And a figure in our sport that will greatly be missed. Such a interesting comparison between post-life, post-tennis life Roger Federer and post-tennis life Serena Williams. I think it's going to be really, really interesting to watch how those two sort of hold themselves and see themselves in the future because, uh, unfortunately, we're about to head there, Dev. We're not too far away. Mm -hmm. The clock is ticking. Uh, we'll talk more about Serena, I'm sure, in the weeks to come as we get closer to the U.S. Open. But when we come back, Simon and I return with 10 things we think about Canada, more specifically the National Bank Open. Of course, the winners and the losers coming up next.
Welcome back to the Open Air Podcast. It wasn't all about Serena this week, of course, though it probably should have been. We had some tennis to play, and boy, did we get some good stuff. Simona Halep, Simon, back to start our takeaways from this. We're going to go back and forth, but you, I could let you go first uh, because I'm feeling benevolent today. And I also wanted to talk about Simona, or Simona, as she's known at York University in Toronto. Let me quote your number to start this. 185. 185 match wins at WTA 1000 tournaments. More than any other player reached 18 WTA 1000 finals. Tied with Serena Williams, the aforementioned Serena Williams, since this tournament level was introduced since 2009. 185. Do you think that's Mm -hmm. the most stealthy number in all of women's tennis or in all of tennis? That Simona Halep is 185 match wins at a thousand level. I couldn't believe that, that it sort of snuck up on us that way. It did. It definitely did. Because you compare her to some of the names that are also around that number, and it's Justine Hennon and Victoria Azarenka and Conchita Martinez and Monica Seles and Venus Williams. She's in that that sphere. It did. I honestly, Bush, I think it's it's been it's been such a long road back for Halep. And the fact that it's I think it's since 2020. The last time she's won a title of this magnitude, it's been a long time. And obviously, we have to thank Patrick Mortagler for that, but do we not? <laughs> it's, uh, we've won, but at what cost um, come to life? I did, you know, he was there. Shouts to P-Matt, uh, P-Mo. He was there in Toronto. I hope he went to King West to take in the sights, <laughs> went to uh, Ravel or Lavelle or whatever, wherever people go in this in this part of town. But he was there, and I thought the embrace after the match was was telling. Yeah, he's helped her, Simon. I think we can safely say he's obviously helped her. Yes, I agree. She will rise to world number six in the career, in the world rankings on Monday, the first time she's back into the top 10 in, I think it's two years. I think it's quite a long time, right? It's almost two years that she's been inside of the world's top 10. I mean, does she have another slam in her, Dev? That's that's the big thing that I'm wondering ahead of this. Just given how not necessarily wide open the field is going into the US Open, but just because given the topsy turvy nature of some of the form of the world number mm-hmm. one, mm-hmm. she has a chance at the US Open. A surface that she's historically done fine on. Perhaps fine is doing some heavy lifting. I think more is expected of her at at that level. Um, just given her, some of her past performances at the US Open, but. If this was going to be the year to put it all together and do it on that surface in that tournament, I could see it, Dev. I could still see it. Definitely could. She made the semis in 2015, I believe. Um, I, I will say in a notch in the I'm a skeptic column, she looked quite gassed by the end of this match. And I understand, I think the final itself was spectacular and... Beatrice Hadid Maya was phenomenal throughout the week. I think she ended up playing like 13 hours on court. But Mm -hmm. I think Halep ended up netting out around like 10 hours. By the end of the match, you could tell a lot had been taken out of her. I wonder how she'll be able to progress uh, through Cincinnati and into New York and be able to peak at the right time. Because so much of these things I feel like is... It's a horrible cliche, but peaking too early is real, I feel like, in the WTA. Because there are so many people who can pick you off in a second round. So I'm hopeful that she can. And the seeding will help her, I feel. Yeah, I mean, flattering to deceive, I would say, at the US Open. There's no, I mean, getting to a semi-final of a Grand Slam is is not terrible. Uh, Shocker to say that. But in general, given the stature of what she is, given the match wins that she has, her status is one of one, the amount of time that she's been inside of the world's top 10, I think you would expect a slightly better record at the US Open, um, given that it's a surface that she probably should be better on. In general, I know it's a slow, boring, nothing, hardcore, but in general, she has the ability to play on that surface. And maybe it's like negating some of the weapons that she has. Maybe she needs to slightly quicker court to do that but then again that doesn't explain a success on clay either (laughs) so go figure these courts were quite slow hey yeah good god it wasn't great to watch my dad my dad's like they turned them into clay they turned them into clay it sounded like he was having a meltdown but it was true incredibly slow should we uh move on 
to a name that I did not expect to be talking about on this podcast. Um, I, I'm going to cr- give you a curveball. Actually, maybe I will go with that um, <laughs> because I wanted to talk about PCB first. So it's going to sound bizarre if uh. I begin with Tommy Paul. But I'm going to talk about Tommy Paul. I'm gonna, thanks for accepting the curveball. I'm going to send it over the fence. Tommy Paul lost to Dan Evans in a pretty entertaining uh, under the lights match. In the quarterfinals on Friday night, I thought the match was quite great and Dan Evans had a great week. But just generally, Bush, Tommy Paul, aesthetically, phenomenal to watch. And the match against Alcaraz, I think you'll talk about Carlos in a bit, but I found that match to be highly intriguing. And just as someone who is a fan of aesthetically pleasing tennis, Tommy Paul is the total package. And for that reason, I'm truly hoping he emerges as the class of this, this American tennis crew. It's true. My Taylor Fritz fandom is... it's. It's wavering, Simon. I'm I'm now entertaining a second tease. What if I was to tell you that Tommy Paul has only made it past the second round of a Grand Slam once in his career? It's kind of a strange scenario for him to end up with because we talk about aesthetic pleasing game and someone that, again, passes the eye test in so many ways, like looks looks the real deal on court in terms of all the shots, big power game, moves really well, all of these things. Never, never really put it together at Grand Slam level, has he? It's, it's a, it's a really strange one to watch. I feel like one of those guys as well who, perhaps, it has taken him some time, and someone who has used the challenger system or the the lower levels to a high degree to benefit himself, and now is getting in these main draws and causing problems. Getting into a quarterfinal here, he got into the fourth round at Wimbledon. You have to like his chances to at least match a fourth round appearance at the U.S. Open Bush. He would be someone I think could make a run of the quarters for sure. I'll go next again, though, back to back. I do want to talk about PCB because this guy took all of the shtick, all the slander. And I thought one of those moments that I like about tennis the most is after he beat Hubie Hercatch, he went to his coaches and he screamed in his coach's ear and you could tell he had had a, just a ter- terrible, terrible season so far. I think he lost in the first round seven times. Yep. So to come back from that, and to win a master series, we've laughed. We laughed at Cam Nori. But the players that he beat along the way, just to list them off, Berrettini, Rune, Sinner, Jack Draper, Evans, and then Hercatch, that's pretty formidable. I respect this win for sure. As do I. He ground our boy Yannick Sinner into... To dust, to, to <laughs> a fine pulp. A pulp, man. To use the thick of it. He quote. killed our boy. He killed our boy. <laughs> he did. He uh, he will grind him into dust and uh, use him as wet cement, wet cement in his bed, in his bathroom, or whatever the hell the quote is from uh, <laughs> thick of it. Um, he will grout you in his wet room. I think is the actual quote. Man, Pablo Carino Buster is uh, Nick Kyrgios's favorite, is he not? Um, <laughs> just given justice, justice. Some of the things that's been said over the years. Uh, if I was to be reincarnated as a tennis player, I think I'd take Pablo Carino Busta. Wouldn't it be nice to be that, just, just that rock solid? Oh my God. Just metronomic. Just cannot be broken down. Rock solid. I love it. It's not particularly flattering to watch or particularly interesting in a lot of ways, unless you're fully into your your grind sort of mentality. Like I love the toughness. I love the, you know, I love the the sweat. I really get in for it. It's the same kind of crowd <laughs> yeah. that loves the Novak Djokovic kind of thing. Like, man, I love 38 shot rallies where no one hits a powerful shot. <laughs> no one goes for a winner. Yeah, sure, man, whatever. Um, but yes. Pablo Grunovus is amazing. I really, really do love him. And congratulations on this tournament. Easily probably the biggest title of his career. And yeah, by all accounts, a really good dude as well. Yeah, I think he has a couple 500. He had one 500 win uh, in 2021. But yeah, this is by far the biggest win in his career. So shouts to him. Also, Bush, shouts to Coco Goff for a massive achievement. Coco Goff is the world number one. That's right. She's the world number one. Snuck up on, I think, quite a lot of people, but she is the world number one in doubles, not in singles. Twist. Dun, twist. Dun. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, was Coco Goff's entire career riding shotgun to her doubles career? Question mark. Um, she won this tournament uh, with the also, I guess, a kind of surprise package given how Jessica Pagula's season has gone. But she, I, actually saying that, Jessica Pagula is inside of the top top 10 in the world he had a good tournament this week too rock solid again like just yeah. shows up continuously maybe not the most flashy game in the world but someone who continually makes deep runs at these at these tournaments 
Coco Goff's going to have a monster season next year. I believe in both singles and doubles, and she's already had a monster season in doubles, and she got to a Grand Slam final. So given your definition of what monstrous looks like, I think we're about to, good. Yeah, I think we're about to see something really, really special, and it's not far away at all. At 18 years and five months, she's your new number one in doubles, and she's the youngest to accomplish this since. Can you guess, Simon? Serena Williams? Martina Hingis, 1998. Martina, of course. Damn it. I knew it was going to be one of the two of them. Good Wait, guess. Uh, Serena Williams ever made World of War in the doubles? Oh, dear. Did they play enough tournaments to do that? I'm going to have to quickly check they? that. Probably they did, actually, early on. That's one of those Christmas trivia questions, that is. Well, you're <laughs> checking that furiously. I'll go on to my next one. Um, Takeaway, disappointment, I'd say, Felix Uh, I, I felt like... He had reached a new level of, of bringing the crowd into him and, and performing under the lights in his hometown against uh, Nishioka and then following up against Cam Nori with just a beatdown. Like, he didn't let Cam Nori get, get close. One of the best serving performances of his career, but quite the dud against Casper Ruud on Friday. We were texting back and forth, Bush, but I, I think we were a bit surprised to see the level that seemingly the gap was between these two players and it came let me to consider like tennis and home court pressure i want it's really hard to gauge i think i was seeing some discourse on on twitter about is there a home field advantage in tennis is there too much pressure if you're at, at home in tennis i wonder what you think uh i think probably uh, also as an individual sport as well you don't have the benefit of your teammates you don't even have the benefit of coaching in in quotations i'm aware of how coaching works in tennis but what's going on like from the start of the season where it was all going so well and so swimmingly the last three or four months have been brutal really really not great from Felix Oje Ali Asim do you have any read on this Dev because it's it's very very strange I don't really I think yeah I mean if, if you came into the season and said the best that Felix would have would, would have netted out at this point in the season would be a couple quarterfinals and a quarterfinal at the Australian Open. I think you could say that's not what we were hoping for after what he achieved at the U.S. Open last year and what we were expecting from him in this season, which was a big one. Yeah, but Dev, like bodied, like not even bodied, didn't come, come close, like absolutely annihilated. And on a Casper hard court, I, and I know, I know that cl- this is now basically clay, so it's basically Casper Ruud's favorite surface. But that being said, also on a hard court, also at home. I don't know why he didn't play at night on Friday. I'm sure there's some scheduling reason for that, but it's just a languid performance and quite disappointing to see. I think you're right. I think some players are different; they're built different. They accept the pressure that comes with being at home, and they they thrive on it. Thinking of Hugo Gaston, who is Roger Federer when he plays in France, um, <laughs> when some other guy when he's not. So I, I get that it's not a cookie cutter type thing in tennis. It's hard to maybe extrapolate the data on this one specifically. You dial the clock back and listen to our podcast after Felix won in Rotterdam earlier this year, beating Stefan. Sky's the, the limit. Final. Sky's the limit. Anything is possible. I think he's now? free fall since that point. Not quite since that point, but like c- certainly in the last few months, it's been tough, tough, tough sledding. Uh, I mean, you mentioned pressure. Pretty easy transition to the quote that I absolutely loved from Carlos Alcaraz this week. Um, Specifically, it was a tweet that he put out, but I'm going to quote what he said during this week. Um, Right now, I take each match to challenge for me to stay the same as always. I am the world number four. Jesus, he's the world number four, Dev. Christ, how did that happen? Um, (laughs) One of the favorites to win this tournament. So it is a bit tough to handle the pressure. But I'm training my best. I'm training with the objective to improve and try to produce the game that I produced on the clay season and in Miami. It is a challenge for me to be the same. It's uh, not often that you speak or you hear a young player speaking about basically failing to handle the pressure and how much bullshit comes with uh, mental games that you see. I've been watching a lot of football recently and just how much fake testosterone there is in that sport. Tough guy, bravado, it's yeah. Just bollocks. Um, and then to see this like very honest kid basically say like, yeah, it was really difficult. The pressure got to me. I broke down. I couldn't handle it. Uh, and I'll learn to deal with it. I'll get better next time. You know what? Round of applause. Fair fucks to this kid. That's not an easy thing to admit. I like it. 
gives me Stan Vavrinka vibes for that tattoo he got. Never, uh, I can't remember the exact uh, quote on it, but it was... Is it fail better, right? Something like that? Right, right. I think this is part of the uh, trusting the process, part of that horrible sports term that I've just used, but... Everything about this kid, I really like, and even that that Tommy Paul match I mentioned, like you could tell he's clearly not playing to the best of his abilities, and he's recognizing it in real time, and almost unable to comprehend maybe at the, at his age that this is possible at his level and how many reps he's putting, in, and kind of realizing that this is a total package. It's not just about physicality or your forehand or your backhand. It's about your mentals, and it's about heading into matches with some perspective, perhaps. I think that that Nadal maniacal, my opponent thinks he's better than me and like I, he's going to take everything I have, that idea, it's, it's not something you can pass on to another competitor, right? I think it's got to be something you grow innately within with inside yourself. I agree. I agree. Whatever that drive is and whatever it takes to, to continually bring it every single week, and that Nadal one is just... I'd love to know what's in the mindset of those big things sometimes. <laughs> Even Serena, yeah. right? You'd love to know what's inside of the mind just to be like, how the bloody hell do you just keep going to have this drive continually to want to win everything? Let's transition to the world number one on the men's side, at least for the time being, which we'll come on to in parting shots. Daniel Medvedev, it's been a weird, weird past few months for him. Not least because he's basically not been allowed to play uh, by the All-England Club on grass or in general in that surface, but it's not really been smooth sailing in his return to his more favorite hard courts. It ended fairly uh, lack, in a lackluster fashion against Nick Kyrgios during the course of this week. He didn't look great, really, um, on the way to winning the Los Cabos titles. Admittedly, he didn't have the highest standards of players that he was up against, but he mm-hmm. managed to see off Cam Nori in devastating fashion in the, uh, in the second set. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how many points Nori won in that second set, but it can't have been very many. If he made double figures, it was quite impressive. And like, it's it's just got to be a strange period of time, right? Because he's dealing with so many things that are outside of the sport. Where are we at with him? And what do you think of this loss that he had during the course of the week? Loss is troubling. I mean, Kyrgios, say what you will, the guy is playing at a quite high level. So I don't think there's any shame in losing to him, even if... Daniel's coming off a win in Los Cavos, but uh, you're right. A really weird time. He got heckled by some random people in Montreal after he lost, which we'll talk about in parting shots. The ranking freeze and everything that's created this situation it is super bizarre because, like, the, he is now a world number one in name only, perhaps. Like, Alexander Zverev wasn't played at all really recently, is only a couple hundred points behind the world number one ranking. It's all very bizarre. And for someone who couldn't play at Wimbledon and has kind of had a lost summer, I find it. I find it unlikely for him to recapture maybe that that magic he had a few years ago in the North American swing. But I would like to see him back to his old self of the U.S. Open because we need some more. We need old Daniil. We need someone who comes in like the octopus he is and, and plays quite well on the biggest stages. So I hope to see him play better as he gets closer to New York. Agreed. Should we go rapid fire to close out this section? R- rapid fire, yeah. Um I went to see some tennis this week because it was in Toronto and I live here and I saw Igor Svantec, uh just destroy Tamjanovic in very short order. But from the seats I was sitting in, Simon, I had a really good vantage point on both players because I was sitting, I guess, um, in the grandstand and kind of uh, looking at both players horizontally. Yeah. Sure. No, vertically. Sorry. <laughs> vertically. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm getting a sense of the pace in which they're delivering their shots with and the ferocity of Iga Shiontek's forehand in real life was ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. What I will say, though, is that from watching her then and then watching her in the next match and seeing her redline again early on, the game plan to beat her now is seemingly be hang with her a bit as much as you can when she's redlining, but attack the dip because there will be one. And that's what Haddad Maya did. Buy the dip. If you want to use it, <laughs> did. Hey, man, I got extreme Federer vibes for sure. Because <laughs> how many players, how many players have waited for Pete Roger to settle down a bit? Because you're not touching that, and then attack the malaise. And I, I kind of, I saw a glimpse of that with Friantec as well in person. Uh, do you want to close your rapid fire by shitting on Canada? Yeah, I was just gonna <laughs> say I, I, I get, I get. This is the first year back as well after 
the pandemic kind of made everything very closed off last year and it was terrible. I, it was not great. And this year was far better. I had a great time and everything was open and some was out and music, et cetera. But just the constant urge to sell you stuff all the time and just the per- pervasive capitalism on display at all times. And they let you bring food in, which is great. And I wasn't expecting that. And I think that was a good move. But just overall, the experience at these tournaments is just so, I don't know, Bush. I, I guess I'm naive to believe that it doesn't have to be all about this and the sponsors and et cetera and presented by this and opened by who but you know what I mean I think at a certain point it it just makes me kind of numb to it all and it feels of just very very corporate uh no issues here everyone just uh, go ahead and consume uh, that's what I want <laughs> summarize from this yeah rapid fire on this one just to go really quickly Quen Chang is going to be really good Dev <laughs> like yeah just, just really really good i think that's one and I know, I know she's a little a little older right i think she's 19 right at the moment um just in terms of I know, i'm aware of how stupid that sounds but what, the, like, what? <laughs> yeah, you're going the idea of just given some of the age that we've seen some of these players come through and, right. and have maximum right. success at the top level i think she's a grand slam champion I, I really do. And I think it's coming pretty damn soon. If if you were to tell me that she walks away winning the US Open title this year, I 100% could believe it. I think she's up to 41 in the world. That's a bold claim, Bush, but I wouldn't I wouldn't bet against it because I could look quite stupid in a few weeks. That Andreescu match was quite fun to watch. The win was ridiculous, though. I, I don't think any player held serve for at least the first two sets, which made for some amazing, um, maybe... Junk balling is too harsh with some ad- adaptive moves, I'd say. And I thought in the press conference uh, when she was talking about basically her mindset and like being frustrated at herself, I thought it was a great insight into her character and what she's like. And she's a funny person. I like her. I like her banter. So I hope to see more of Keen One going forward. We retweeted that on the Open Air Twitter account if you want to find that video from a couple days ago. I think that's it, Simon, for our takeaways, unless you've got anything else. Let's get a parting shots. We haven't done it in a few weeks. Parting shots. Party shots. It's been a while. Coming up next, party shots to wrap up this week's show. Welcome back to the Open Air Podcast. For the first time in many weeks, after we denied our guests the right to do parting shots. I love how Tom wanted to do parting shots, so we <laughs> shut him down, Simon. <laughs> Because of our strict, <laughs> our strict coded regimen. What have we become? Yes, a guest who comes on so <laughs> so beautifully, you made such a lovely work, and we tell him no. Sorry, you can't do it. Not on this time. We're like, join the Discord and talk about it in there, which he did, and it's great. <laughs> and you should too at patreon.com forward slash open era. All right, there's our plug for the Discord party shots. That's right. And someone else who's joined the Open Era Discord recently is uh, Daria Katsukina. Um, Shocker, um, right? <laughs> who would have thought? <laughs> dove into the D- Open Era Discord. It was surprising. Uh, what did you make of this announcement? What did you make of the f- of the fallout from it? In quotation, fallout. Daria Katsukina coming out, coming out, <laughs> literally, I guess, in some capacity. Um, Quote, living in peace with yourself is the only thing that matters. Fuck everyone else. What a quote. What a, what a great quote. Secondarily, I believe it's important that influential people from sports or any other sphere really speak about it. It is important for young people who have a hard time with society and need support. Obviously, I think Dev, I, everyone else who works on this podcast fully support those words in general. I think it's still, unfortunately, quite difficult to be in that community or uh, to be, yeah, I mean, just in the, depending on where you are in the world, but regardless, it's still, yeah. it's still difficult. Like it's still frowned upon in some, in some capacity and you should never have to have to have an argument with someone about the people that you love or you choose to have a sexual relationship or who you're attracted to or like the things that make you who you are. Like, and I think she's dead on by saying that influential people in sports do have an important message to spread about this so uh, i just wanted to take time out to say bravo to her and in general good shit well said good shit indeed i mean <laughs> she's a i think she's a hero to be honest i think with the way the way she's put herself out there and the danger i think she could put herself in as, as being a russian tennis player and saying this and feeling comfortable to say this um along with her girlfriend 
who's an Olympic figure skater. I thought as well, this, uh, some of the quotes from her fellow players were also pretty heartening. And I mean, so surprised that Naomi Osaka would be one of those. But uh, quote, I do think we have to rally to support her because it's a bit of a dangerous situation. I think in all of that, it's really incredible that she's coming out and she's standing for what she believes in. I'm always in support of that. Uh, Coco Goff saying she was super happy for Kasekina. I these are good people, and I think that's why the WTA is generally better. But it's it's one of those things again where you're like, yep, they 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 got it. They know what's up, and that support that they're asking for, we have to deliver it. And it's, it's it goes beyond the words of Steve Simon and and the, the heads of WTA, and it goes to actions as well to protect these people. Uh, she also followed that up by absolutely demolishing and winning a tour title as well, which was great. She's inside of the world's top 10. Uh, things are looking up for Dira Katsukina, and fingers crossed they continue to be that way. Talk about a power couple as well when your partner is yeah. figure skating in the Olympics. Olympic Jesus figure Christ. Skate, yeah. <laughs> Shall we move on to Ash Barty? Ash Barty is married, Dev. We covered the story when she was engaged uh, with one of the most wholesome Instagram posts with Gary Kissick. Uh, the the engagement has turned into a full marriage, which is a very <laughs> Is that an stiff. Australian turn of phrase? Is that is that what they say in Australia? Or you know when you're like you're approaching a sentence, especially when you podcast and you're like, fuck, I'm halfway through this. I've got to think of a way to save it. Can't do it in the edit, gotta do it live. Um it was a cool cool image. And I think we followed this from the very start about how they seem like a really cool couple in general. We followed their their relationship in some ways and, and the way that he appears sounds, supporting her. Sounds incredibly voyeuristic, but I think, we, yeah, from afar we did. We did, I guess. This has not been a good segment so far. <laughs> Axe all of it and keep going. I will say my my huge prediction of Ash Barty coming back next year, this lines up with the honeymoon time to end this year. Look out, 2023. I will say on this one, the rate the French are going by cementing up the holes on golf courses, she's going to have trouble actually getting around at some point. I, it's spread to the UK as well, this cementing go- a golf course thing. I uh, support this as an idea. Keep going, Should we everyone. explain what's happening? Do you want to explain <laughs> br- briefly what's happening? So there was, a, there was a water ban which was in place in France, and I believe it was some people from uh, XR, right? I think it was Extinction Rebellion, or right. someone who was at least affiliated with XR, who showed up to cement the halls of a golf course to basically say that... Because golf courses were exempt from the water ban, um, and they are, I mean, terrible. Just terrible for the environment across the board. So um, that was basically what happened. Incredible stuff. Uh I'll go next because you've got a couple, Simon. Uh, that Daniel Medvedev video I mentioned uh, in Montreal, he's walking away after the loss to Nick Kyrgios and some fans are heckling him, calling him a loser, probably some other stuff that's like caught in the video. But Daniel like hears it, stops what he's doing, walks towards these fans, kind of confronts them verbally, gives them a talking to, carries on with his day. So a lot of backlash to this or reaction to this, including from Kyrgios, who's like, how can we treat people like this? This is awful. And part of me is like, well, sir. <laughs> written words are considered abuse as well it's not just if you're saying them that it counts twitter is the thing as well but it did lead me to believe simon like the online discourse and like the internet culture of just being a complete asshole to random people and yelling at people and now it like becoming a thing in real life isn't exactly new but i I guess it does say something to me about like not tennis twitter but like the way we talk about individual players and i i as guilty of this as I'm, I'm sure anyone else is, but it is, it's a lot. And I think we could, we could do what we could do better to maybe relax, not our language, but maybe to relax the, the direction of our ire at some points. Cause I don't think anyone needs to call Daniil that would have a loser at any time after losing a match. Yeah. I mean, it's punching up and punching down and all that sort of stuff as well. And targeting people who have positions of authority. I think that's reasonable, but just going and telling Daniel Mavidev that he's a loser doesn't seem like a particularly Why? kind thing What's to do. What's going on, man? Yeah. It's not really achieving anything at all. Be better. And honestly, it's such a low bar, and we are all cascading into the abyss. But before we go, let's let's try to be just slightly, slightly better. That's all I ask. Moving on to something more uplifting. I would say Rafa Nadal is back. He's in Cincinnati. He was talking about Serena and in his classic uh, Rafa way, talking about the plenty of memories they've had together and calling her one of the greatest sports people of all time. And 
feeling lucky to share the tour with her. Some good words from Rafa, but also he's back from pretty serious rib injury. Rafa can get back to world number one, Simon. And I think this is now leading to your prophecy, which for the for once, for once in your gosh darn life, you're close to getting a huge prediction, right? I did it, Dev. I fucking did it. <laughs> <laughs> you're not there yet. You, you need Rafa. You become the biggest Rafa stand now that I know. I'm so happy. I'm so damn happy. I had a, I had that feeling, man. I knew it was going to happen, but just to actually be vindicated on this one. If he gets back to world number one, bloody hell, what a, I don't know. We kind of over it at this point to say what a comeback, seeing as he's done it 25 times across different bionic lem- limbs and all the different things that he has. But this one is right up there in, in terms of the his comebacks just from where he was and he thought his career was over and multiple times through the course of this year you thought that the man was dead on court and managed to still continue to come back it will be an astonishing achievement if he gets back to world number one one quick point on this dev yeah if you are outside of the tennis world and let's say you're you check in at grand slam level or something you you'd like to watch the four grand slams or maybe you just watch the u.s open if you're in north america do you think you would have any idea what the top 10 is at the moment in the WTA and the ATP because it is absolutely batshit wild in terms of where everyone's ranked at the moment. Here's, here's a question for you, just top of the head. Who's the world number two on the WTA side? Uh, <laughs> is this still content? It? it is. <laughs> or is that, yeah, That's right. Who's how, the world how, number is three? Maria, how is Maria Sakkari the third ranked player right now? I don't understand how that happened either, to be fair. What in the world? Wow. Yeah, Muguruza's nine still as well. Shocking. Moving on, Simon. Lorenzo Massetti. It happened, Dev. I told you. <laughs> You're on a roll. You're on a roll now. There's a lot of I told you so's, a lot of look at me now. How could you have doubted me? It's not been a great week since that point, it has to be said. Um, it's not been a great run since that point. But in general, you know, all those all those questions almost, all those comments about whether or not he's actually going to be able to have that run that everyone thinks he is, goes into the final against Carlos Alcaraz on clay. Everyone thinks, you know, it's nice and easy for Carlitos. Charlie's just going to run away with this. No, did not happen, did it? My boy. It's a shame. It's a shame on you for digging back to a July 24th result. <laughs> to brag the hubris the hubris you just no you're right though and i'm i thought that was a massive moment for him based on the fact that i think the not is he not a fighter or does he have the will it's like does he does he have the stamina does he have the ability to withstand uh someone like an alcaraz in a match like this even if it's not over five sets and i think just the way he did and the way he played all week with some massive wins uh big moment hopefully you can build on that i mean since then like you said Bit hit or miss. You know, the proverbial or the this sort of niche, weird terminology behind feel for sport and whatever it turns out to be, his feel for a tennis court is absolutely ridiculous. Like, truly, it's remarkable. Like, knowing which angle, which shot, the anticipation, all that sort of stuff. It's all there, man. It really is. It's not, I don't think it's just between the ears. I think there's some pretty flaw. I think there's some technicalities that he's, especially on return of serve, just given he's going to really struggle on quicker surfaces to ever have good results consistently long term. But I, I think this guy, I think he's capable of winning the French Open. I really do. I think he's that good. Let's hope so. Moving on, the CDC, Simon, they're up and they're at it again. Those CDC guys, but they've changed the rules in the States. Basically, it's COVID. It's like, eh, like, eh, just be generally aware and we'll we'll ask you do nothing now if you come in contact with COVID or test positive. It's like, it's, it's each their own doggy dog world. Good luck. But the speculation is running rampant now that I'll, that'll lead to changes in terms of travelers and unvaccinated travelers to be more specific hashtag let novak play good lord yeah which is now being used to, like i saw salman rush the established and the first response is hashtag let novak play i'm like we have lost the plot people this is not the proper response but as as we say this on august 14th to 15th august 15th simon what percentage chance do you give novak djokovic to play the u.s open 100 i think i agree i think he's gonna play 
which is gonna be utter mad man what a hilarious ending what a cap to this cycle would it be if he just fought waltzes in to new york the the real question is which uh which official which line judge is gonna be in his ire this time round? now it's a it's a joke what what a bizarre scenario across the board that we sort of end up here a farcical situation at the start of the year and really this i think is farcical if it ends up the way that it does just in terms of health regulations and just the most absurd unhinged twitter fandom standum that you see behind this player and a while ago we did a, a an episode which sort of broke down why he gets the reaction that he does and the kinds of people that follow him it's a really really strange toxic mix of people i think in general and it's gonna be really weird to see him win this title Dev. it's gonna be really strange and i don't want to be that guy's like not all novak fans but not all novak fans like again there's not there's a lot of normal novak fans who are not putting this hashtag everywhere they can find it but yeah it's it's upsetting we'll see what happens i think 100 percent too U.S. Open tickets. I mean, since Serena has made an announcement, they're flying off the shelves. They sold more. T- I think they sold more tickets in that span than they ever had, apparently, in like a three-day span this early on in the tournament. Like you said, it's going to be a shit show, but this should be one of the wildest tournaments I think we've we've ever come across in terms of tennis. It finally got me last year. It finally sucked me in the U.S. Open in a tournament that I just do not like the surface. I don't like the kind of tennis it produces in general. I find it boring, but it got me. I think the storylines and the drama got me, and I think the same is is true this year as well. And I'm actually looking forward to it, Dev. Yes, on record as saying it. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Um, <laughs> no, but yeah, it, it makes sense. It makes sense, and I'm excited as well. I was we were thinking about going, but due to inflation destroying us all one day at a time, I think we'll have to postpone till potentially next year. But the open era meetup will happen somewhere. Somewhere that's not. Canada. Somewhere else, I guess, will be equidistant somehow for all of us. Yeah. In a perfect world, pie in the sky. Simon, any ideas? Maybe that place will be Paris in 2024 with the announcement this week. Segway. Roland Garros will be the home, unsurprisingly, shockingly, of the tennis tournament which is taking place at the Olympics. Uh, The dates got announced 27th of July to 4th of August 2024. That is not a million miles away from the French Open. So we're going to have another one of those weird situations where we'll have back-to-back tournaments with sort of a grass court season quotations sprinkled <laughs> yeah. in the middle of that. It's going to be very, very strange to go clay, grass, clay in a very short space of time. But was announced during the course of this week. I thought it was interesting to include here because I've never been to the Olympics, Dev. I lived in Vancouver when it happened in London and I lived in the UK when it happened in Vancouver. Vice versa, at some point, I will get to one of these things. Ethically, can you attend an Olympics? <laughs> I feel like that's an actual question that we should ask. Well, just given some of the things that the pair of us have said about the IOC during the past <laughs> four years of podcasting together, we're never going to make it. It'd be a bit rich. It'd be a bit rich. I'm like, all right, everyone, we're meeting up in Paris for the Olympics. <laughs> but hey, hypocrisy is in, apparently. Let's close this sucker out with... Uh, a open question which appears the which has appeared in the notes for parting shots. Would you like to explain yourself here? Uh, I was I was being cyber bullied in the uh, <laughs> Discord about like no, I was we're talking about music and, and Pog was mentioning that Roger Federer was at a Calvin Harris gig in a pizza, in a pizza. Um not a not a Calvin Harris stand, but Fed and him e- look equally washed in the photos, so I laughed at that. But then Pog uh, Pog's had his channel, the goat, was saying he pictured Federer as more of a Coldplay guy, and then he did some digging, and yes, Federer is a Coldplay <laughs> guy. He's been to multiple shows. I chimed in saying, hey, the early stuff was great. I got some support from Priyanka, but uh, this is an open question from Josh, Cogmulant Josh. He says, who is someone who people unnecessarily hate, but is actually probably fine, aka the Coldplay of tennis? Casper Rude. <laughs> I think that's a great answer. That's a great answer. Like, why? He's fine. Yeah. That's all. He's fine. He's fine. <laughs> he's fine. <laughs> I'm in full agreement, so we can move on to parting shots. I think that was the, the perfect answer I was waiting for. Uh, so, two challenges remaining, Dev. Would you like to go first? It appears we have a political bend to both of ours, so I will allow you to go first because we are linked here. We do. Uh, I was in the course of doing research for today's show and... and 
bumming around on the internet. I came across an article in Gawker, RIP Gawker, but long live new Gawker, I guess. Not doing too bad these days. Claire Coffey wrote Failure to Cope Under Capitalism. Subtitle, The Inability to Do Basic Tasks is Not Always a Political Problem. I found reading this to be quite cathartic and maybe it it kind of helped me help me come to grips with some of the feelings I've been having recently about this current state of things and where we are and and the fact that um, it's been a pretty wild couple of years as I've I'm sure you've all realized but uh, I'd go check out the article it's not too long either but um, yeah I think it just sums up the, the mood at least my mood quite well these days. Do you find yourself that you've managed to process what happened in the pandemic? It only really started to strike me in the last month that I missed two years of my life, of my early 30s, where I was supposed to be going and enjoying myself, that were basically not there anymore. And for obvious reasons, right? Like there's bigger things here to keep people healthy and safe and all those sort of things. But I'm not convinced that I've actually yet come to terms with that or reckoned with it yet. I do think... It does feel like time is just generally moving faster now afterwards, yeah. even though we are not technically done with anything. It does feel like this this idea to make up for lost time could also be quite uh, unhelpful as well. It's true. It's true. I'll stay with the political bend and say that I was heartened. Uh, I was impressed and wanted to wish solidarity to all of the folks in the United Kingdom for the Enough is Enough campaign who basically have come out of the labor movement and the trade union movement in the back of the energy crisis, if you want to call it that, energy bill crisis, which is going on in the United Kingdom. For those of us in North America or for those of us outside of the United Kingdom, it is an absolute shit show going on over there in terms of the cost of a lot of people to be able to afford um, their energy bills with many people not being able to afford it as we sort of head into the colder months of the year and people basically being cut off and not being able to afford uh, all of the things that they require to actually survive. Um, so Enough is Enough was a campaign which was started a couple of weeks ago. It broke the site in terms of how many people signed up for it immediately. And I just wanted to shout it out because obviously they support it and their five pillars are basically real pay rise, uh, slashing energy bills, an end to food poverty, decent house, houses or homes for all, and taxing the rich. And I think if you listen to this podcast, you could probably get along with all five of those things. Check, 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 and check. Amazing. Perhaps we'll put these links in the show notes as well, in the show description, Bush, so people can check it out. Absolutely. Solidarity. Solidarity. The notes are there. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Reminder, we are on patreon.com forward slash open era. Join us there. Get the show ad free. Get it early on Sundays when we record. Plus, join our Discord where we are chatting tennis and everything else all the time. Discord was bumping this week, a great place to be as we added some new faces. Um, some members of the community are in now and we, it's been a really great time. So I would recommend it if you enjoy chatting tennis in your spare time to join us on the Discord. We're also on twitter.com forward slash open era. And if you could give us a rating or a review wherever you get this podcast, that would be extremely great for us as well. For producer Greg on the ones and twos and for Simon, thank you so much. For listening to Open Era, we'll talk to you next week. 